The conversation around cannabis and sports has evolved over the past decade. One player who may have been a little ahead of the times when he played was Ricky Williams. The 1997 Heisman Trophy winner and Miami Dolphin great had a potentially legendary career derailed due to his cannabis use. Now he's a public advocate for the flower and has his own brand of marijuana. I got his thoughts on the evolving conversation around the drug and his reaction to Arch Manning joining Texas. We also look back at the 2008 Miami Dolphins Wildcat team and I got his thoughts on the current Miami squad and of course what he thinks of Tua. But first, be sure to like and subscribe to this page for more conversations and content like this. Now here's my conversation with Ricky. I know perception around cannabis in this country has come a long way in the past decade or so, but looking back a little bit on your career in the NFL, were there ever times where you personally felt ostracized for your cannabis use? Well, I mean, I've always been a different kind of guy, so feeling ostracized is not anything is not anything new. I think the difference with cannabis is something that I I was hiding about myself because I was afraid. And but when I finally got over that and just shared my story and was real about who I was and what was important to me, everything in my life changed, but not in a negative way, in a positive way. So I feel like I'm an advocate, and it's not really just for cannabis, but it's really for anyone who feels like they have to hide who they are because they're afraid they'll be ostracized because that's no way to live. How do you feel like you'd be viewed now or how much has changed in perceptions around weed and sports? Well, a lot has changed. I mean, you know, the fact that there's so many states where you can legally consume cannabis and even the leagues now are not testing or punishing as much as they as they used to. I don't think it's gone far enough. I think in the future, teams are going to be supplying cannabis for the players because they've realized it's a healthier alternative than pharmaceuticals. How prevalent was weed use in the NFL when you were playing? I'm curious. And also, how is it now that the league is? I was going to say, like like I'll tell a story. I mean, I, I played a long time ago and I played for a long time. So things have changed a lot. When I first got into the league, my rookie year, okay, a Hall of Fame player on the team, he's in the Hall of Fame now, invited me over to his house. Okay. And he gave me the speech about how to take care of yourself in the NFL. Okay. And he, he pulled out some cannabis, crushed it up, split a blunt, opened it up, put the cannabis in there, took a Vicodin, crushed it up, sprinkled the Vicodin in there, rolled up the blunt and passed it to me. Okay? That, was, <laughs> that was a vet teaching me as a rookie how to, how to take care of myself in the NFL. Okay? Things, have, things have advanced. My last year in the NFL, I was playing for the Ravens. And at one point, I was, we were in the playoffs. I was, I was leaving the facility and there were guys coming in with a plate full of brownies, okay? They're gonna go watch film. <laughs> so, watch film, so, yeah. you know, and the way the, the way the NFL, and now because it's it's more legal, I'm sure it's you know, it, it's to the point. Why wouldn't you, if you're in the if you're in the NFL? The NFL is spending a million dollars in research on the impact cannabis and CBD can have for pain management. I know you've talked a little bit about that, but when you hear that, what are your thoughts on that now? I see that um, Austin Powers, one million dollars, right? It's like, it's not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money, but it's a, it's a move in the right direction. The fact that they're not punitively punishing players anymore. Now they're actually investing something into research. I think it's a step in the right direction. Famously, back in the 90s, we saw Brett Favre um, really deal with his addiction to painkillers. And we currently have an opioid crisis in this country. I know you mentioned about it briefly, but how prevalent was the use of painkillers in the NFL on like a on a broad spe or a broad spectrum? Well, I think usually when people say, well, when I hear prevalent, I think of a negative connotation, and mm -hmm. you know, it was that it was just part of the everyday like deal, you know. Especially at the end of the game, the trainer would walk down the the, the aisle of the plane with his with his container and just handing out Vicodin. But Jeez. football is a, it hurts. Right. So there, there is a big issue of how to how to manage pain. How do you feel we as a society or maybe just the NFL, um, how we can get to a place where cannabis replaces o opioids as the initial go to for pain management? I know in the future that would be a good idea. Like you said, how close do you feel like we are to that? Well, I don't think that, you know, cannabis is like a is a panacea that it's going to make everything better. To me, it opens up a larger conversation about preventative health, preventative medicine and herbalism in, in general that there are more ways to, to treat humans than throwing pharmaceuticals at them. So for me, it's really about opening the conversation to different, different ways. You know, when I played football, I wasn't just consuming cannabis. I was doing yoga. I was meditating. It, there was a whole, I was eating differently. It, it was a whole lifestyle. And I think, 
you know, and again, this is a big part of the brand is starting to have these conversations. Cause I know when I walk into a room and people start talking about cannabis, they're, they listen, you know, and, and they're open to my perspective and my insights. And it's, I've just seen this as a myself in a position where I can really make a difference with starting these conversations and opening up the dialogue. It's been a dark age because even most of the research that's been done on cannabis is trying to prove that it's that it's bad. And even all of that research, they couldn't prove that it was that it was a bad thing. And so it's really about having these conversations and encouraging people to do their own research. I mean, my mind is blown about the amount of people I've met who've done their research looking for for why cannabis was going to destroy their life. And at the end of the day, they become advocates because they couldn't find anything. Have you ever thought about how your career would have played out differently if you were playing in today's NFL, given that they don't test for cannabis anymore? Like, would you be holding the rushing record, you think? No, 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 no. No, I, I don't think so. I think I, my issue wasn't cannabis. My issue is I had other interests other than football. You know, cannabis helped me realize I had other interests and gave me the courage to pursue those other interests. But, you know, from, there's just an assumption, I think, that if someone plays football, that that's what they're supposed to do and that's what they're supposed to be good at. For me, football gave me a platform to, to tell this story and gave me the resources to be able to travel and do a whole bunch of really cool things. So I'm, I'm like elated with, with my career to be able to do the things that I did, still walk away with 10,000 yards rushing. And now I get to talk about cannabis in a meaningful way where people actually listen. And I think that's a, that's a win. So you're a Longhorn legend. We obviously have to ask your thoughts on Arch Manning. Like how big of a catch was that for the program? That's huge, obviously. You know, when you when you get the, the best player in the country, it, it draws a lot of attention. You know, but it's just a start. And the, the team and Sark, they have to make sure to, to capitalize on the momentum. But but it's it's great and it's exciting, you know, especially on the, the eve of us going into the SEC in a in a year or two. So it's it's exciting. You were there in kind of the early glory days, like prior to Vince Young, but you were there when Texas was Texas. What makes that place special when the team is good? Well, actually, when I got there, they weren't quite Texas yet, you know, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to, to come to Texas, because I saw they were on the brink and then I could be a big part of moving them a little bit closer. And so after I won the Heisman Trophy, it really, and Mac Brown did a wonderful job, really attracted a lot of talent. And that's brought in the Vince Youngs and the Colt McCoys and the national championship. So, so I, I was part of putting Texas back on the map. And I think this is a great opportunity for Arch to do the same thing. And I think my guess is that's what really intrigued him because when Texas is Texas, you know, there, there's nothing more special in, in this country. And I think, you know, the fact that when Texas was on top, you know, ESPN gave Texas their own network, you know? Um, so, so again, I, I, hopefully, you know, we've been, we've been crossing our fingers, but I, I think hopefully we're, we're back. Right, we're back. I was going to say, everyone's probably asked you, I was about to ask you that, is Texas back? So you say yes? Well, we keep crossed? saying it, but you know, we're the eternal, <laughs> we have to be the eternal optimist, okay, until Gabriel <laughs> blows his horn, all right, that's, <laughs> that's what we say. You had some special years in Miami, so in 2002 in the 08 Wildcat team, what was your fondest memory as a Dolphin? Um, uh, you know, really my fondest memory as a Dolphin was my first season there, 2002. You know, we, we ended up not making the playoffs, but we had a really amazing team, a really amazing group. Um, and I ended up leading the NFL and rushing and, and Pro Bowl MVP. It was just a special time, making that transition from New Orleans to Miami and getting a fresh start and really, just really enjoying playing football in Miami. It was, it was a good time. So when the Wildcat season happened, how did that come about? And who came up with it? When did you know it could work? I want to know. So Wildcat, um, Coach D. Lee, David Lee came from Arkansas and they had run the Wildcat the year previously with Darren McFadden and Felix Jones. And so he came over as the quarterback's coach for the, for the Dolphins. And we put it in in training camp, but you know, the day, the day we installed it, you know, he started talking about this Wildcat stuff and, you know, I was already in my thirties. And so I was thinking, I'm not going to be on the field. And then he, he, he drew it on the board and he said, Ricky, you're actually the Wildcat. You're the one that's going in motion. Oh no. And so I was, I got excited because in that formation, there's four running backs on the, in the field. And so our whole running back room was on the field. So it was, it was exciting for us, but we didn't think it would actually get into the game, but we kept practicing it and practicing it. And then the season started, we were one and two. And we, we were playing the Patriots next week. And, and so coach came in and he said, we're bringing it out this week. And uh, when you're one and two, you're willing to try anything. 
So we, we were ready for it. And uh, it took the NFL, definitely took the Patriots by surprise. Uh, but I'd say that, that's also probably my second favorite memory was bringing out the Wildcat against the Patriots up there. And, uh, you know, just watching Bill Belichick and that defense run around, not having any idea what was going on. <laughs> priceless. I was going to say, it probably felt like the best thing in the world. <laughs> but um, I, I think people forget in 2007, the Dolphins almost went 0-16. So how did you guys complete such a historic turnaround? Like, that's crazy. Well, actually, that year I was I was suspended. And I, I ended up coming back at the end of that year. Um, and it was like one of those bad luck seasons, I think, for the organization. I came back against the Steelers on Monday night. And I think the first play in the second quarter, I tore my pec uh, right off the bone. And ended up being on IR for the for the remainder of the season. So, for me, that one of my se one of my eleven seasons was a was a quarter, you know, that ended with the torn pec. Um, but after that year, they they got a new coach. Tony Sprano came in, and you know he just brought a lot of discipline. Coach Parcell, Bill Parcells came in and brought a lot of uh, experience and and fun. Um, and we, we turned it around. You know, when you get a, a group of guys that are hungry and ready to do something, then, you know, good things happen in the NFL. Did you ever think the Wildcat could be sustainable beyond 2008? Or, like, why didn't it work longer? Well, when people say the Wildcat, you know, it, it's a very general term. We were, tech, we were technicians. So when, you know, the, the different variations that in the time and effort we put into running the Wildcat, that's what made it sustainable. But, you know, in the nature of an NFL season, the team only has a certain number of hours to practice and to devote. What are we going to focus on? And I think what made us so good is we spend a, every most NFL teams every day. They have about a half an hour walkthrough to walk through something. And we would spend our, our daily walkthrough walking through the, the Wildcat. So we were just spending much more time working on it than teams had time to prepare. But I think other teams, they saw it as as, you know, a gimmick that they could steal, steal a couple of plays. And so I, I think that's why it wasn't sustainable. For it to be sustainable, someone has to devote the time and the effort into to getting it, to, to running it well. Well, it's been 15 years since the Wildcat. Miami hasn't had a better year since then record-wise. Why should there be hope that Tua, Tyreek, and, and you know company can change that? Well, first, the beginning of the football season, you always got to have hope. You know, not, or you're not, a, you're not a real fan. But I think the Dolphins have done a good job to, to give evidence that there's should be hope. You know, I think signing Tyreek Hill is a, it's a big deal. As a matter of fact, I saw him yesterday at an autograph sign. Um, they got Jalen Waddle, so they got a lot of speed. I think two has got weapons. And Miami always plays defense, right? And I got a, a new coach that has, you know, it's got some momentum. So I, I think I think Dolphin fans have a lot to be excited about. Between two and on and Twitter trolls, it feels like every throw to a makes, even in practice, is under a microscope. Do you believe in him as a possible franchise quarterback? Well, I think for him to be successful, I think the fans need to believe in him. You know, and so because yeah, I think it's so it's so difficult. And I, I, you know, I, I know a little bit about Tua, you know, and there's something about when you have the, the, the support of the, the group or the family or that, that's really all you need. But when there's doubt, something doesn't feel right. So I, I think the most important thing for his success is for people to believe in him. But I think what he can do to help himself is make it easy, make it easy for people to do. Hey, sports fans, if you want to watch more sports seriously, be sure to check out these clips right here. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel to see all the great content from us here at USA Today Sports.